Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 511, I think. And I'm hoping it's 511. It should be 511. I hope this meets you well, wherever you may be. Episode number 511 of the Agostino Zynga show. Me back again in the daylight. So you know I woke up early to record this. Hope you're good. Hope you're well, wherever, wherever you may be. On this hallowed, hallowed, hallowed day. If it's the first time check out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. I'll be greatly appreciated. If you're listening to this via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review, a four-star review, a three-star review, a two-star review, a one-star review. I don't care. Leave some sort of review on the Apple Podcast app. Let people know that you love the show. I've seen already some great reviews on there. Please, if you can, add some more on there and I'll be greatly appreciated. I cannot wait to see what you put on there. My love and affection goes out to you. Thank you so much thank you so much and of course if you want to support the podcast via patreon please do too at patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just agostino for that bonus content only available via patreon i've got a little review coming up of my night out in fabric for the 22nd anniversary i've got an exclusive clip that's going to be going out there at the end of the week so make sure you jump on there actually not in the week. i'm going to do it tonight i'm going to upload that tonight so if you're in the patreon you'll see an exclusive review of my night in fabric for the 22nd birthday um some exclusive clips of dj ricardo vero was playing inside the fabric you know meant to take pictures or videos in there but i happen to sneak a little footage for you guys specifically on the patreon so make sure you jump on the patreon to get all that rave exclusive footage and other bits and bob but yeah man here we are back again in the sector in the seat hope you guys are well wherever you may be Obviously, some of you have noticed something different on the video if you're watching this. I'm sans white glasses today. They are somewhere else. I have to go and pick them up later, <laughs> which I'll explain on another show. So for now, I put on these little bad boys I picked up in Berlin a few years ago just for the vibes, just to make sure I'm continuing with the shades vibe and not revealing my eyes and showing you how dark they are and how much of a non-human I might be. But yeah, back again, feeling good, feeling fresh, feeling healthy. I've got the old um, anti-allergy tablets running in the body. You know, the old, I've got a little subscription on these via Amazon. What are they called? Uh, Claritin, right? Got the little Claritin tablets going. I've got some green juice with a massive bit of garlic in it, a little bit of lime, um, you know, kale, uh, pear, ready to go down in the goblet. Oh, Nothing nicer than fresh, freshly made um, healthy drinks at home. Can't really beat that. But yeah, here we are, man. Back again. Been a bit of a tumultuous weekend for me, especially being a United fan. Heavy loss to Liverpool on the weekend. The refusal of my club to sack Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, even though he's clearly not the guy that we need to take us to the next level. Um, also, the embarrassment of the of the loss anyway and recent form would be enough to get most managers sacked. But United's a different case, and it's interesting place to be. Interesting place to follow. Um, nothing really makes sense. Everything's upside down. The, you know, what you call it? The ex-pros who are associated with the club care more about their personal relationships than they do about the club, even though they tell you they love the club so much. Um, you've got players coming out, leaking stuff about the manager and the coaching staff, which I'm not comfortable with, but I am because it's furthering my quote-unquote agenda because I want the guy out. But also it shows a lack of um, professionalism, respect in general for the, the players, half of the club and the people who run it, and obviously their coaching staff who are essentially their bosses. It just feels a little bit gross, you know what I mean? But again, we are living in the 21st century. Player power is a real thing. To expect these guys who are paid millions of dollars and pounds who are endorsed by all these different companies to accept a loss of that kind of level and to just ex ex to just accept all the blame is a bit naive you know i mean they're gonna accept some of the blame but they don't want to be disparaged or disrespected online or in various parts of the media when they know it's not always always it's not always their fault it's partly their fault so they want to spread the blame equally which i understand i get but it's just a bit disconcerting to see then there's loads of stuff on the news. There's the whole Alec Baldwin stuff that's happened that's been really, really distressing to watch from afar. Like, there's been mad, odd stuff going on in it. So we're going to just get into all of that. We're going to talk about as much of it as we can. Um, we're going to try and make it funny. We're going to try and make it informative. And we're just going to keep on going on in it. That's it. That's all we can do in this weird thing called life. I think I realised that the other day when I went to Fabric, 
I was in there hanging around, dancing, having a good time, pumping my fist in the air, you know, shuffling to the left and to the right. And I was like, it's always gnarly when you come to tour places or you go out in general and you think to yourself of all the other people out, who, all the other people who aren't able to go outdoors, who are still strapped to like ventilation machines, who are struggling to breathe, people who have lost family members, people who haven't been able to leave their home because they have no money, they haven't been employed for ages. I've got loads of friends who have like struggling to get themselves jobs or to get back onto the employment ladder. I've been fortunate enough to get something just before things like to get a little bit crazy, right? Like it's just, you can't even wrap your head around it. Like the misery that's out there in the world right now. People are miserable. But we're just trying to get through it because there's nothing else we can do. Legitimately, nothing else that we can do. Um, like I mentioned previously with the whole like new pandemic, no, with the new um, mutation of this virus going around at the moment. Like you can't make us care anymore because you've kind of lied to us so much over the last 18 months. You spun the truth. You've, talking, you've spoken half truths. You've misspoke. You've put people in really financial, for financial destitution where they probably can't be able to get out anymore. And now you're telling us to care about a new mutation. Some people are going to be like, you know what? I'm just going to take the risk. I don't necessarily care what this new mutation does. I'm just going to take the risk because I can't handle this anymore. And I don't blame you. I really, really don't blame you because what's the, what's the alternative? Sit there and worry about things that you cannot change. You cannot influence. You cannot make any real meaningful difference about nothing. There's no point. You're seeing all these insolent Britain people. They probably got good, you know, their, their intentions are in a good place. They're probably looking at things from a holistic point of view. They have the, they have, um, they have big hearts, you'd assume, right? They're looking after the um, future um, humanity of the world or in general. I don't know, whatever they're looking after. But in general, people are dragging them off the street because they don't give a fuck. People are dragging them off the street because they have their own issues. They have their own problems. They have people they have to look after. They can't care about the world or about climate change. They really can't because they have so many day-to-day -day issues that are piling up in front of them. Before they've even opened their eyes, they legitimately can't care about the next day. It's literally about the next minute, the next hour, the next day the next week even like it's like god man it's like it's, it's mad isn't it? it is mad when you think about it but again we just kind of we ignore it we pretend it's not happening we just dance the night away like i did and we just go back home wake up hungover go to the gym you know go to work that's what we do i mean we don't necessarily care it's, it's funny when you think about it really it is funny we don't all care none of us care no, we don't. We don't really care. We tr we pretend to care. There's a hot button topic that pops up on our timeline from time to time when we care. Even this Alec Bolden thing. Sorry about that. Oh. Even this Alec Bolden thing. It's been four days. Obviously, I haven't recorded since then. And even that's moved on. People have kind of not cared about that anymore. It's just kind of... Do you know what I mean? We live in such a weird world, man. But I think a lot of it has to do with our governments and how they've handled the pandemic. The fact that they've crushed most of us in terms of our prospects for the future. They've kind of delayed most of our plans. Some of our plans are basically being thrown off kilter for, you know, for the maybe for the foreseeable future. Again, you have... Imagine, you don't even have a job now. And they're trying to make you worry about the housing market. You're like, you know what? I can't even pay my rent. Why am I worried about the housing market? Why am I going to be worried about kids in another country? Why am I going to be worried about this this epidemic going on over here with this um, population of people in this place of the earth? Like, why would I care? Do you know what I mean? It's so mad how they did it. It really is. And it's such a missed opportunity again because the pandemic was such a great opportunity, I felt like, for people of all walks of life, especially the ones, the downtrodden, the ones that have been overlooked, doesn't matter where, where you are, what colour creed you are, to band together and to unite in an effort to kind of call attention to the disparity that exists in the world, right? Wealth, inequality, socioeconomic levels, whatever it may be. This is the opportunity for us to all gather around, arm in arm, lock arms, uh, you know, under each other and stuff, and start singing Kumbaya, and start pointing the finger at these guys and saying, hey, you know what I mean? You guys are taking a piss. There's not, it's, this life isn't fair. We don't all get an equal shot. Do you know what I mean? Some of us do start, you know, um, further down the line than others. It's not a lay let level playing field. But instead, no. They expertly put it, they expertly did something in a way where we're all infighting. All the downtrodden people are infighting. We're all kind of calling each other names. You know what I mean? We're we're all it's all it's all a nonsense that we've kind of taken our attention away from them. We're all worried about again just paying our bills and making sure we keep our uh, our lights on in our house, clothes on our back, food on our table, or bellies or, or, or food in our bellies. That's it. Do you know what I mean? We're not worried about the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is far more 
kind of worrying if you think about it in all in all terms purposes. But again, I can't speak. I'm a hypocrite in my own regard. You know what I mean? I'm going out, getting on it, being an absolute lout, um, a liability, and just ignoring everything else that's going on in the world. So I can't necessarily speak from any sort of point of, um, uh, you know, morality or anything. You know what I mean? I can't. I don't have any. I mean, my morals have gone out the window a long time ago. It is what it is, but I don't know, man. Saturation to be in it. But what can we do in it? What can we do? Let's just keep on trudging on, keep on trudging. And that is basically maybe the lesson of life in general, right? Like, let. I think this is something, like, I forgot what philosopher said this, but something along the lines of life, for the most part, is miserable. Life is misery. You just have to kind of accept that fact and try and make the best of it despite in spite of it right that's basically you, what you have to do in uh, despite it being miserable you have to make the best of it and that's what you're doing because if you think about your lifetime you think about the times that you're going to be miserable the times you're going to be downtrodden you're going to feel a little bit flat they're probably going to outweigh the times you're going to feel amazing or exalted but what you do and what makes life worth living are that those moments are so good that feeling is so amazing you can't bottle it you can't put it in a pill, whatever it may be, that you're just going to keep chasing it because you know how sweet that feeling is, right? It's like losing weight. It's like getting that job you finally wanted. It's like passing your driving lesson, getting your first car, having your first flat, um, losing your virginity, kissing somebody, right? All those feelings are just like, oh, do you know what I mean? Like, when, and when you do it, you like you want to do it again because that feeling is so good. Of course, it's not going to be as good as the first, first time, but it, you, can, you can replicate it to a ex certain extent. And that maybe is the purpose of life, right? Just to keep on trudging, to keep on putting one foot in front of the other, despite all this miserable stuff that's happening in the world. Um, because there's not much you can really do about all that miserable stuff. It's just funny that people who fool themselves into thinking the things that they're doing are actually making changes, isn't it, right? Whether it's posting a black square on a social media, using a hashtag, you know, changing the color of their profile. They, they, they legitimately, that's the... That's the um, somewhat sad and pathetic side of humans right we legitimately think that thing is actually doing anything for the people who are marginalized the most who are hurt the most right um who don't have a possibility of getting out no that isn't really that really isn't doing anything um but obviously that's 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 what happens when you're a grown-up you try to accept that those things don't do anything but you do them anyway just because you want to do it right but you don't under the false assumption that oh yeah this is making a change you're like no this isn't going to do anything but i'm going to do it anyway because i want to do it and also i'm going to back this up with an actionable thing whether it's going out and volunteering in a soup kitchen whatever you're going to do something that is actionable in your community to help so yes you can't affect a terror you can't affect change in terms of um terrorist policy in parts of europe right or terrorism policy whatever it may be right you can't affect that but what you can do is kind of back that up with something local soup kitchen helping at homeless um volunteering at something whatever you can back it up people don't do really do that they just point the finger and keep it moving and and i noticed that a lot with the flipping gabby petito thing i had people calling me out in my comments because i made a gabby petito comment i was like oh this whole white women's syndrome thing is a nonsense right it's just another kind of ruse from the media to have us fighting each other this is bullshit it doesn't mean anything like so what if there is a white woman syndrome what does that even mean if anything use that white woman white no missing white woman syndrome as an opportunity to shine light on people from marginalized or unreported communities, well, from overlooked communities whose disappearances haven't been covered by the news and stuff. We know that's true. We know that does happen. The news can't represent or can't talk about every single tragedy that happens in your city or in your state. That just isn't logical, right? It doesn't make any sense. But obviously, they're going to kind of pivot and, and angle stories that are going to be good for clicks, good for views, whatever. We know that's the facts. So if they want to highlight the story of of a missing white woman who's blonde and pretty cool use that attention that they're putting on her story don't divert away from her story but use that same light to maybe angle it a little bit slightly to what you're talking about so people can talk about that you know those missing people and hopefully along the way we can kind of bring those cases to some sort of resolution and give those families closure and we did for the sum part right with the guy petito thing um not we did but you know um society at large especially in america they did in some respects because five or so bodies i think were found in the search for gabby petito so it actually did work it actually did help but all these people that were calling me out my comments saying oh yeah you're saying this or some lady was like oh you're not even black like what are you talking about bruv like legitimately what legitimately shit are you talking about like what are you talking about and also again forget me forget my personal feelings what are you doing in this situation to help anything what are you doing because again, you're saying I'm not helping. Let's imagine I'm not helping. Let's let's say I'm not. Let's say I'm an em enemy of all black people out there, missing, um, you know, minority folks from all around the world. I am the enemy. Let's just imagine that's true. 
cool, I accept that, my bad. Now, what are you doing to, you know, highlight those cases? Nothing. These people call you out online, they say you're not doing the thing that they want to be seen in the world, but they're not even doing it themselves on their own platform. So you're coming to me, and I don't even have a platform, I'm just a guy talking shit into a microphone at home, talking rubbish before I go to work. That's all I'm doing. I'm nobody. I'm a no one. I'm insignificant in a grand scheme of things. I disappear tomorrow, no one remembers, no one cares apart from my close family and friends. That's it. I'm a blip in the flipping history of time. I'm trying to leave my mark in the cultural history of time, but for the most part, I'm a no one. I'm a nobody. But still, somehow you come to someone like me and say, hey, I demand you do it this way. Why don't you do it on your own platform? Everyone has platforms now. This whole idea about platforms is nonsense. We all have platforms. We have voices that can maybe help to spread and further a message. We've seen it before. Collective social media action can have some sort of help and influence into kind of bringing light upon certain cases. It might not make meaningful change, but it can bring attention. It can start a conversation. So why don't you start a conversation on your own platform? Why don't you do it on your own platform? But they don't. Why? Because they're full of shit. That's the thing. I know I'm full of shit. These people don't know they're full of shit. Do you know what I mean? That's the issue with life in general. And again, the media win all the time. These powers that be, they always win because they have us fighting each other over nonsense, bruv. Nonsense. At the end of the day, Gary Petito still went missing. She still died. Her family are still mourning the death of their daughter, sister, whatever, auntie. You know what I mean? Like, someone's still passed away in this, but here we are fighting about who... The, the colour of someone's skin that wasn't represented on the screen. Okay, cool. Let's find them also and get those family closure. Doesn't mean that those five families um, whose um, family members were were found in national parks are now any happier that that's, been ha that that's happened. Some of them are probably holding out hope that their family members were still alive, but they're not. So it's just a tragedy all around. And again, it's they've won all the time. They always get us to fight over these nonsense things. But it's just... I don't know, man. I just look at all this stuff and I just think to myself, like, this is a this is a crazy world we live in. It legitimately is an insane world that we live in that we're doing all this to each other. It just doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't, man. I'm just, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But again, it's just one of those things, like I said, I think life is just generally misery. You just have to pick yourself up and go every single day, one step at a time. It's equivalent, essentially, like to losing weight. You don't necessarily see the changes that you're making every day, right? But, those days build up over time, right? Uh, a, a couple of days, a week, a month, you know, a year. And then suddenly you turn around, you're like, wow, look at who, I, look how I looked in pictures in January. I looked how, look how now I look in pictures in December. And you can clearly see a difference. But when you're going through it, you don't. But you just have to keep trusting that it's going to happen. The same sort of thing with life. You just put one foot in front of the other and you just hope, hope that things are going to get better. That's all you can do. Because if you spend too many, too much time in the weeds, too much time on social media, too much time arguing with these people, you're going to end up thinking like life is just full of these people that are just angry about nothing. But in reality, most people in the outside world are just trying to get by. They're just trying to live a somewhat decent life. Go out for a dinner or two. Get on it here and there. Go and watch a movie. Go on holiday. Whatever they're doing, they're just trying to make the best that they can of an institution. They're trying to have a, just a flipping ice cream at the end of the week, mate. Some people's treat. A pizza, an Uber Eats, whatever, man. Some people order those things twice a week. Some people can't order that stuff once a month. Do you know what I mean? The disparity in, in flipping. <laughs> Honestly, like I don't I don't get it, man. I really don't. But I think some people are just hiding the pain that they're going through. So some people don't really understand what's happening. But I think there's a lot of pain out there, man. There really is. Man can feel it. Man can feel it. I'm somewhat of an empath. Nah, I'm not joking. I'm not an empath. But I don't know, man. The, the vibes, the vibes are just not there going out. I think again, we're just all in this weird trance. We're trying to fall ourselves as they are. They're not. And I feel like people are generally just going through shit. And, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. Let's crack on, man. This got way too deep too quickly. I don't mean to be that guy. I apologize. So let's just crack on and just keep doing the thing in it. Um, so let's do this. Yeah, let's do this first of all. Let's go first. Let's just go quickly over the whole Oli Gunnar Solskjaer thing. Because this happened the other day. So I'll just give an update now. Um, this is Kurt Sky Sports News. Oli Gunnar Solskjaer is better to stay at May night despite 5-0 defeat against Liverpool. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is expected to remain in charge of Man United despite the heavy defeat against Liverpool and the fact that a small number of players have reservation about the manager. The feeling within the club is that while the results were a bit disappointing and painful for everyone, the immediate focus is on improving after picking up one point from the last four Premier League games. United next two Premier League games are against Tottenham and Man City, both live on Sky Sports, and they also face Atlanta in Champions League next week. But despite their poor results and huge sorry, external speculation, 
There's no suggestion from inside the club. Social job is under threat at this point. Social job is still training on Tuesday with the team not in action again uh, until Saturday, having exited the Carabao Cup surprise defeat against West Ham last month. So Ferguson was in attendance at Carrington, but it's understood that the former United boss was not there to speak to Solskjaer or the squad. The majority, if not all, the United squad, like Solskjaer as a man, um, believe he was done great things at the club, but there are a small number of reservations. All the players are desperate for Solskjaer to concede, given his legendary status at the club, but some are doubting if he can deliver that success. Sky Sports has learned some players are unsure about the coaching methods with not enough emphasis on pressing and small-sided games. Meanwhile, in Italy... Reports are reporting that um, Chelsea manager, former Chelsea manager Tony Conte, has been in contact with United about taking over. Should they decide to make a change, as Casper News understands that there has not been contact between the parties. If United were looking to make a replacement, Solskjaer is likely that they would want a manager with a different profile. Conte is not a particular hurry to return to work and will still take his time and study any proposal which may put him in front of him. Um, it's likely that he'll have more options in summer considering his success at Juventus, Chelsea, and Inter. Solskjaer called a five minute defeat at Liverpool, the heaviest home defeat in the fixture his darkest days you know he managed Norwegian as adamant the club um, are close to achieving the success he says we've come too far as a group and we've closed um, we're too close to give up now he said on Sunday I've heard nothing else this is the lowest I've been but I've, as I've said I accept the responsibility I do myself I do in my I do believe in myself I do believe that I'm getting close to what I want to to get with this club I think that what we've done what I've seen, the development, of course, the results lately haven't been good enough, but I've got to keep going strong. I do believe in what we've been doing, the coaching staff and the players. Solskjaer now faces the huge task of picking his squad up and against uh, ahead of Saturday's trip to Tottenham. Uh, United are seventh in the Premier League with nine games to go. So... A whole entire shit show of a situation. United lose 5-0 on the weekend against their bitter rivals in Liverpool. It, it kind of follows a bad run of form. The performance was terrible. Again, you can lose games 5-0. Um, it happens in football. Also, it's not like, you know, it's not a desirable result. But the manner the which, which we lost it, the fact that Liverpool took their foot off the gas for the last 20 minutes of the game. <clears throat> Again, if we face the Man City with Pep Guardiola, who's a kind of ruthless machine when it comes to kind of adding more goals to the tally of his team, that could have been easy in the double digits. So, so something definitely to be worried about. And then, of course, the fact that the players down tools for the most part, probably came on, brief cameo, got himself sent off. All this sort of ill discipline shows in general there's a real lack of respect the players have for the coaching staff and maybe the coaching staff that have for the players in general. Just all in all, bad vibes all around. Then all the little stuff going on with the team, Greenwood and Round, now they have an issue. People have an issue with Maguire now with his captaincy. Like, there's loads of stuff happening. People have an issue with the fact that some people get picked despite having poor games and never get subbed. All these weird things that like us as fans myself included have been saying for the longest time and we've had top reds right shouting us down specifically i was talk about this forum that i used to be on called fred tissue called the united forum right full of absolute donuts right who for the most part would shout you down if you started to talk about how poor of a manager Oli Gunnar Solskjaer is and the fact that what you saw on the pitch on the match day was definitely a reflection of what they do in training and that's left you concerned because we had no style of play no patterns of play no method of attack no method of defending we just looked like we were a hodgepodge of individual players put together and asked to hey go out there and perform and hope that it bit of individual brilliance as they're calling on social media win us the game and for the longest time it actually did work for two and a half seasons it did work but then eventually that type of approach of football isn't going to work and the teams that are better organized that have better structure from a from, from you know from uh, from the boardroom level all the way down to the pitch will definitely end up catching up and will definitely end up being successful despite sometimes the managers that they have in charge look at Chelsea man they had Roberto Di Matteo in charge of their team and they still won the Champions League what's Roberto Di Matteo now those type of teams and the way they're structured are basically built um, in a way where the managers don't matter as much as maybe as a club like United do which is why I kind of push back on people like Stephen Housen from Stratford Paddock and his own channel who kind of talks out both sides of his mouth he'll say you know he'll talk about how he's so he'll talk about how detail oriented he is when it comes to his own team right and the work that he does and the books that he reads and the tactical approach that he takes and how serious he is with training blah blah blah, blah. but then suddenly when it comes to united and it comes to our team the manager isn't as important there's no such thing as new manager bounce all these sort of things that he kind of prides himself with his own team for some reason doesn't necessarily get um spoken about the same way when it comes to Man United, which is bizarre but let's say that is true let's say that he's he's right 
in some respects, in order to get to that point where managers are not important as they are at United, you're going to need to have a structure in place that's similar to some of the best clubs in the world, like the Bayern Munichs, like the, you know, like the, like the, like the, even the Man Cities, how they run now at the moment, right? They put in another manager, you know, they had, they had Pellegrini in charge and he won the league too, right? They had these ma managers that are not world class, they're not world beaters, but they're still able to kind of replicate some level of success. If that's the case, we're going to need a structure in place that's maybe going to upset a lot of the top reds because it's going to involve getting a lot of external people in, people that aren't necessarily part of the class of 92, that don't know what the United DNA is, that don't give a fuck about United DNA, they just want to do a job. They're going to be the ones that are going to need to hire. But again, that's a story for another day. Going back to the game in general, going back to our club, then obviously following that loss, the rumours swirl around, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is going to get sacked, those people are getting briefed, Fabrizio Romano makes a video preempting Ole is going to get sacked, he puts it I think in his playlist, forgets to unlist it, people grab it and think oh my god he's getting sacked, of course that doesn't end up happening, the Conte links are extensifying, then they kind of die down because people are talking about his profile and how he is, his temperament and again just insane kind of theories that are coming out of United and again the entitlement it's just bizarre to think that we are the only club that deserve a manager to stay at our club for 10 plus years just because we had one coach that did that it's just insane especially when you look at the cl the kind of landscape of football management or the landscape of football business in general, especially at the top end, the fact that there's so much on the line, there's so much at risk, the fact that these clubs can't necessarily risk having a manager in place for more than three years who isn't successful because, you know, that's going to affect their commercial side of the club in general. That's just how it is, right? There's too much money on the line to allow that. Obviously, we would love to be in that kind of place, but in general, that's never going to happen. So the quick turnaround in players and in coaches is just the nature of the game because these people are the most help maybe, are the most expandable and also hold the most value especially in players when it comes to players and managers you know it's going to go first as manager always because there's too many players to get rid of all of them to give the manager you know the cartel blanche to do what they want but anyway that doesn't happen then the stories come out again leaked that oh ollie's actually going to stay and then you're like bloody hell they're actually going to let him stay off the back of all this noise that's happened the fact that the club never came out to publicly back the guy and say that we don't care what happened we're going to stick with him until december or until or until the summer right or yeah or until basically the end of the season nothing comes out they let all these leaks come out from the players players basically infighting everything that we basically were, were saying as fans well we are prophesizing the fact that why would harry Maguire get given a captain's armband when he had, wasn't even a captain of his previous club the fact that he only was there for six months the fact that his performances have been fluctuating up and down for so much and the fact that he's not even you know one of the best defenders in the league let's just be honest you know what i mean could get to cut this down by that club at united is either a mark of your leadership in the club or i'm or kind of a clear indication that you're one of the best players at the club in general right but it doesn't again story for another day all these leads are coming out about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and then they're telling you that he's not going to stay he's going to stay at the club and then you're hearing stories about Alex Ferguson saying that he's going to stay or basically lobbying for him which is again super upsetting but not surprising the fact that we're under Glazer's, Glazer's ownership is in part due to Alex Ferguson even though he's a legend we have to he has to take responsibility for that the fact that a lot of our top reds don't like calling out the Glazers is in part because of Alex Ferguson and he's no value in the market and protecting the Glazers at all costs when he was in charge even now in his retirement he still hasn't said anything bad about the Glazers right even now in retirement he still hasn't said nothing about the Glazers especially when you consider how kind of crippling their ownership has been to our overall long-term successes and the fact that they've never wanted to really rel relinquish any sort of power and control going forward so in a weird place we're in a strange 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 place so now for whatever reason the club are expecting Oli to pick these same players up who essentially threw him under the bus um, to essentially go back into work at a club where people are basically talking about how he's not fit for the job because especially if you read the reports it seems like the boardroom was split some of them didn't believe he was fit for the job but also didn't believe that there was a candidate available at the moment that could walk in and change things or that was a better or that was the best fit for us as a club which again i disagree with but again that's their prerogative but knowing that there's people in the club that don't support you there's players in the club that don't think you're a good enough manager i think there was a story that came out that allegedly after the leicester defeat at 4-2 someone came up to him. i think it was maybe Aaron Bailly called him out and said why would you start harry Maguire if he's injured why don't you just play me do you know what i mean like yeah, you put us in a position again. He played poorly, but it wasn't necessarily his fault. A player's never going to say, I can't play if you give an opportunity to play, especially a captain. So he played and then he had an absolute horror show, right? The Leicester, the Leicester supporters got on his back. He made a couple of mistakes. And then from then on, he just couldn't really, you know, pull himself out of it. It happens. It is what it is. But they called him out. He didn't have nothing to say, I guess. Who knows? But all these things are going on and the club is expecting him to pick it all up. And it leads me to believe 
that all these people that purport to be Ole Gunnar Solskjaer fans that love the guy, want him to be successful, they don't really want him to be successful. They don't. Because if they do want him to be successful, they would say, hey, you're not going to be a success at this club any time of day, like in any lifetime. You're just not. Because we're not set up in a way to bring the best out of you. Because if you really think about it, if you really, really think about it, if Oli was to be a success at any club, especially a top fight club, you'd imagine it would have to be a similar sort of setup to like an Ajax, right? They have like a, you know, a burgeoning youth setup. Um, they get players in from cheap from abroad, young ones that they can kind of mould. Um, they get kind of, they have experienced players who kind of pepper into the squad as well, right? Tadiches, the the Daily Blinds, all these players and then mix in with some foreign players they bring in, like that lad from Brazil who's got a left foot, who's amazing, I think it's Anthony. Um, then the other players that they bring in, right, um, through the academy and shit, players that they buy, they bring in for the academy and then sell on to bring other profits to them to the club to uh, buy other players to so maybe expand a training club session to, tra to expand their training facilities. These kind of clubs are the ones that I imagine that Oli would succeed in because essentially he'd be hired as just like a sort of cheerleading man manager type person, right? Less about the coaching because the coaching has already been implemented these players from the youth setup all the way through who have expert coaches around him. He would just be inserted in as a kind of face, a kind of leadership figure for the team, right? For the club, a rousing figure to kind of get them all in. That's where a manager like Oli would succeed. But when you ask him to do the managerial role at a club like United, where there's no footballing people in charge, where the financial capabilities or possibilities of our club are really dependent on whether or not we where we finish in the league, where the owners don't really care about, you know, um, footballing success and only care about the commercial side of things, you know, win top four, you get top four for the most part, United manager, you're basically guaranteed a job for life. Well, all these things that are happening at United basically limit his ability to be successful. It just does, right? And we've seen it over the last three years or so, or three seasons or so. He hasn't been successful. No trophies won. Obviously, league positions have improved. The points have improved slightly. But all in all, the performances have been pretty mediocre with the exception of the interim spell that he had. And most of it has been in due, partly, with the structure around the club. And I find it funny. I find it hilarious. All these leaks coming out, I've not heard one mention of John Murto. One mention of Darren Fletcher being briefed or being brought in or uh, into the discussion about who's going to succeed um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Because make no mistake, whether it's Tottenham, Man City, Atalanta, whatever it is, right? He's going to go, right? He's too poor of a manager. Football ha tells no lies. You know, Luke Shaw has been unprofessional for the majority of his career. And, you know, now he's suffering basically the effects of it. He had one good season and now we're seeing the average of Luke Shaw, right? Looks a bit tubby for a left back and just generally plays to a level that isn't of the standard that we need at the club like United. No no, no amount of excuses, no amount of narratives that Oleg Mourinho was bullying him, you know, are ever going to kind of do away with the fact that if, you pl if you're consistently poor for your most of your career, it will eventually going to catch up on you. Or if you're, consist if you're not to a level needed most of your career, it will catch up on you. And same thing some things happening with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who eventually will get sacked. And when he does, does the club have, actually have a plan in place as to what they want to do going forward? Not really. Are they biding themselves some time before they make the decision? Probably. Because if you get a Conte in, you're basically committing to another Mourinho sort of type of signing where he's going to come in and want his own players. He's going to come in and want to play his own brand of football. He's going to come in and demand things for the ball that they're not going to be able to promise. All right. And then eventually they're going to end up breaking it off and go to another direction, which is fine. I think football management, and again, it's just United fans that have this idea that for the, some part, we ha for the most part, we deserve a manager that's going to stay at our club for years and years and years. That just isn't the reality of the situation and we need to move on from that we we had Ole Gunnar Solskjaer sorry we had Alex Ferguson as our manager so Alex Ferguson legendary manager but again he was an anomaly he was a one-off same with Arsenal Menga at Arsenal one-off they're anomalies you can't expect the same thing from an Arteta or from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer it's not going to happen they're not of the standard of those kind of coaches and the football's just moved on the competition now in the league is just so strong to expect a manager to come in and have no success for five years in the route to kind of get back to winning stuff with the other guys in, in charge. And whilst they're for the trophy cabinets, it just doesn't make no sense. The fans won't allow it. The sponsors won't allow it. The players won't allow it because players will end up moving if they're not successful. Like All these things are just not going to happen. It just doesn't make any sense. Not even worth even speaking about. But again, we have to say it because some fans are under this impression. So ideally, I'd love for us to be in a position where we hire Conte and we have a plan in place for the next manager coming in because ideally well the manager's available now at the moment who you know again the only people that are available 
three of a job are Zidane and Antonio Conte. The other managers being considered, like the Pochettinos and Ten Hags, have jobs at the moment. Pochettino, I think that boat has sailed. We never wanted to get him in the first place because we were in love with Oli. Now, now he's at PSG. That ship has sailed. I've moved on. Let him do his job there. We continue. The Ten Hag thing I'm interested in because of the way they play football, um, how he appears to be as a coach and as a manager. It maybe is a better fit. He is involved in tiny bits of the recruitment process from what I've read. So maybe he'll be a good fit for the United in the current structure. But again, he would still need structures around him to kind of make him successful. But I'm sure a manager coming in from Ajax is going to demand those things. Van Gaal demanded those things. They didn't give it to him because Ed Wilder didn't want to relinquish control, right? But I, I am sure a manager from, you know, those sort of leagues would want that. I'm even sure Conte would want that as well. Some consultation with the person in charge and whatever. He'd want some sort of um, ownership on that. But I'm also sure maybe in a negotiation process, if they did hire a Conte, United might say, hey, you're coming in under the, pre under the, under the notion or under the idea that you can only use what you have until January and you can only buy when you sell. So he might come in and have the opportunity to be like, okay, cool, I'm going to change the narrative and I'm just going to use what's given to me half the season to show how good of a manager I am and go from there. That may be a solution too. I don't know. But in general, it is kind of a um, a clear indication that United are run by absolute jokers. The fact that they've kind of allowed somebody who they believed in, in Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, to get his position in his career is crazy. I think if you back him as a coach, and again, I don't relate the guy. I don't think he's a good man. I don't think he's a good coach at all. I think he might be one of the worst coaches in the league, personally, in my opinion. I think he'd do a. I think he'd do a terrible job trying to keep up the likes of Norwich and Newcastle. If those are really, if those are jobs that actually test your ability to be a coach and a manager because of their limited resources or because of the overinflated expectations of the fans, despite their limited resources in terms of like the Newcastle and shit. If those man, if those jobs are actual real representations of how hard it is to be a coach. I have a hard time believing Oli, McKenna, Carrick, Mike Feely and keep Norwich or Newcastle up. I, I don't believe it. I don't even believe they even keep a Brentford up. Real talk. I just don't believe it. Because those managers are, you know, especially a Brentford manager, he looks like he's got a system, a style of play he's put, in, he's put in place. You know, he's got players in, in this team who are better than the sum of their parts. He's not just after the names. He's not after individual brilliance. Like, there's a whole different game, ball game going over there. So I'm not even a fan of the guy. But even I have to say, if you are a fan of him at the club and you do think he's the right guy for the job, you have to either come out boldly after the 5 0 loss and say, We're not going to sack this guy under any circumstances until the end of the season because of what so much great work that he's done. We're going to give you this guy the right to kind of try and turn it around, right? Because he saved us after the Mourinho thing, that's it. Or you sack him on the spot and you move on. No in-betweens, no two games, three games. It doesn't make any sense because what essentially they're saying to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, they're saying to him, you have three games to save your career, but if you lose one really badly, it doesn't matter if the scoreline is not that bad, but the performance is terrible, you're going to get fired. How does that make any sense? How can you get fired for one mistake, but then you can keep your job if you do well over three games? It doesn't make any sense. You have to have a timeline that's just set. Like, hey, here's your review. You have six months to save your job and you just have six months to save your job. There is no, oh, it's so bad after two months, you have to leave. No, give me the six months. Give me the three. Give me the two. Give me the one and let's move on. But they don't do that. They don't do that. Now they're in a position, again, they're making this guy come in. How embarrassing it's got to be. He has to come pick up these players who don't want to play for him, who think he's not good enough for the job. Like him as a person, just don't think he's good enough for the job. Players who are openly saying they're not going to sign a new contract unless he gets fired. <laughs> yeah. Players that are moving management. Again, a Pogba's come out and said something different. But for the most part, players are coming out essentially saying that, you know, this team ain't going to go anywhere with this coaching stuff in place. It's just a mad situation to be in, man. Again, well, what can you do in it? What can you do? What can you say? What can you say? What can you say, man? Again, I, I would love there to be a kind of rainbow at the end of this, but a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, I don't think there is. I just don't think you can cheat football. I think the clubs that are the worst run, the clubs where the fans seem to be the most divided. Again, United is so weird like that. Some of our fan base are hell-bent on thinking managers make are all going to make all the difference. Some of our fan base think the transfers are all the difference. Some of our fan base thinks Pogba's the issue, Martial. All these weird things that don't really make any sense. When really, in general, it's the whole structure of the club. It's the whole 
it's the overall of the club. The fact that our squad is imbalanced. The fact that we have players on contracts just because we don't want to let them go because we want to retain their value, which is insane. They're probably not going to be a good influence for the team. Phil Jones has just come back from injury, right? He's terrible, right? But he didn't want to give up his number four show because he was generally thought he was going to get a chance to play in the league. So do you reckon someone like him who hasn't got a sniff, even though he's been doing loads of media, he's been going on Manchester United podcasts and shit, like doing loads of stupid stuff, going on the Times, doing interviews, stuff that you'd imagine would be a way for him to get back into the first team. He hasn't had a sniff. He's been on the sub bench a couple of times, but he hasn't played at all. Do you think he's happy with his performances or with his, with his ability to play for this team? Probably not. Why well, matters come out and said some stuff as well. Like all these things are not going to be helpful because people are again they're going to be positive. They're going to be what's it popular, but they're going to be mainstays of the dressing room. People are going to listen to what they say, like it or not. So the fact that they are still around just because people with the club want to keep them is just wild to me. But again. We move on, innit? We move on. What can we do here? Now, I can't really do much, so there's no point in really talking about this stuff. We just move on, man. Fuck it. Um, what else we talk about here? Yeah, let's talk about this, actually, because I'm tired about talking about the Dave Puffing. This is an f- interesting topic. This is courtesy of the BBC News, right? And it's called Girls Night In. Spiking is part of going out, so it's staying in. Pretty crazy, because I've seen, I've seen a lot of these kind of stories pop up um, from time to time. Oh, why is it not... Oh, I thought whatever. Let's move this this way. I've seen a few of these stories pop up from time to time on the timeline um, concerning spiking of drinks in nightclubs and whatnot. And at first, again, as somebody has never been affected by this sort of stuff, you don't really think much of it. You think it's isolated incidents. You don't think it happens too often. Then you see loads of reports popping up all over the place, all over the world. Then I remember seeing that one girl who made that invention of the straw that you put in your drink that can test if you've got something spiked or not. You bring to a club yourself. Loads of really weird things that you're thinking, hold on. If a girl has to go as far as inventing a straw to test whether or not your drink has been spiked, this is definitely an issue. Then, of course, I have one of my anecdotal experiences where I go to a house party, you know, everyone's getting on it, getting fucked up in a flipping living room somewhere, sharing stories as they do the house party. Right? House parties usually descend into two things, either they're like crazy things where people are punching holes into walls or they just turn into things where you're just sitting in someone's living room playing music from a spotify account talking shit and sharing stories and this happened to be one of those days and i remember one of the girls in the in the living room saying something like um something along the lines of like oh uh every girl has been sexually assaulted or something like that right and i was like what and obviously me being argumentative i was like no nah, that's not true no girls are every assaulted is that true? And I asked the question to the room. Has every girl had some sort of form of sexual assault happen to me in life? And legitimately, every girl put their hand up. And for the most part, all the stories I heard from the girls in that living room were stories involving going out at night, which makes sense, right? Because at night, people, you know, in the cover of darkness can get up to all sorts of matter of nonsense. Girls have their guard down. It makes complete sense. But it also, also was quite scary and quite worrying to think that I had been out in nightclubs before, not knowing that around me, people were getting assaulted by people who you thought they knew, but they actually didn't. Do you know what I mean? That's the real scary part of it, as it's just a, as a kind of casual um, customer of these places, as a patron, as a party person, to think you're going to these places and people are legitimately getting, you know, not molested, but that touched up in ways that they're obviously not consenting to, even worse, in spaces that you happen to be sharing. And it's just really, really bizarre. And obviously these stories have kind of been picking up steam a little bit um, off the back of some of the more troubling instances of women um, essentially having their lives uh, be extinguished just because of just, you know, walking around doing everyday things and not really troubling anybody. And obviously these things have come to light more often. So this is a story courtesy of the BBC. Let's quickly talk about it here it says women across the uk are boycotting nightclubs in this week for a so-called girls night in to highlight the issue of drink spiking and many say that no the change is needed through personal experience and again i also went to talk about this again to touch upon the point i was making before in other topics or other podcasts about me seeing a real dip in attendance of nightclubs now a lot of it has to might have to do with tourism the fact that we don't even though people used to complain about people like this all the time we don't have as many Spanish, Italian, French, German tourists in the UK at the moment, obviously with the pandemic, obviously maybe with some restrictions with the EU. I'm not really too sure, but there's definitely something going on with that population, people not being in clubs. But in general, it does seem to be a real um, decrease in the amount of people that go to nightclubs. From what I've seen, I've been to all. I've been to Fold. I've been to Cause. I've been to Fabric. I've been to... Uh, where is it? I've been to... Um, what's that place in, we went to? Uh, where? Anyway, I've been to quite a few different raves or venues, different sort of capacities that cater to different sort of crowds. 
And I've definitely seen a decrease in people going out. And a lot of my thinking behind that was that I feel like during the pandemic, people have just, or during the lockdown, specifically during the lockdown, people moved on. People got new hobbies. You remember that time people were baking sourdough bread, people were taking up crochet, people were getting into many different things, right? People had moved to different parts of the UK, had left much densely populated metropolitan cities because they were afraid of the of the of COVID. So everyone's kind of moved on with their life or maybe got new careers or just generally just not thought getting on it was that fun. And then other parts of my friendship group have decided to do this new thing that they do where they just book or they hire Airbnbs out. And they just bring or invite a couple of friends, maybe 10, maybe 15, whatever, just a small circle of friends. They maybe have a little, you know, um, DJ controller thing and they play some music. They order some gear and they just get on it in these sort of apartments. And that's usually their once a month sort of like let your hair down sort of thing. Right. And you have the comfortability or you have the kind of safe, you, you know, you're, you're safe in the knowledge that you're surrounded by your own friends. There's no randoms. It's in a place that's not your house. There's no there's no issues with cleaning. You hire a cleaner to come clean the next like loads of grown up shit. Right. Just calm. So that has basically affected people's tendency to go out. But I also assume on top of that stuff like spiking and stuff has made people think, you know what? Is it really worth it going out if I've now changed the way that I enjoy my life and how I kind of communicate with my friends? Because, you know, one of the troubling things or concerning things about the UK or London specifically was that you couldn't really go out with your mates if it didn't involve drinking right, or doing drugs. It wasn't a situation, especially or maybe outside of food. There weren't necessarily things that you could do as friends that, would, that people would like to do that thing that were fun. You invite someone to your house and people are itching to start calling someone to pick up or itching to go out to a bar. It's not enough for them. Whereas I think with the lockdown, it made people enjoy the company of their friends just sitting in a park bench somewhere eating a sandwich because you were so deprived of that kind of social contact that that thing was worth it. Do you know what I mean? That made it all the worth it because you're just talking to your friend, you're catching up. It was just like old times. So the idea of getting on it isn't as amazing, doesn't necessarily tickle your fancy as much as it would other people. So I definitely get that. Um, but let's continue with it. Earlier this month, Mia Dabson, a second year student at Loughborough University, attended the first sports um, social event of the new year with her cheerleading squad. The two year old had decided not to drink a lot and was enjoying her night out when she suddenly felt unwell. She turned to her friends for help before collapsing on him. Mia is also able to is only able to piece together what happened on the next um, what happened next from her friends, but she knows she became unresponsive. I was out cold, completely unresponsive for about an hour, and they said that they were taking me to hospital. Mia is now one of hundreds of women across the UK preparing to boycott nightclubs on Wednesdays night in the bid to raise awareness about spiking sexual harassment at venues. The Girls Night In movement has established support in almost 50 locations, including London, Edinburgh, Bath, Liverpool, Bristol, Formouth, Hull, um, St Andrews and Swansea. The campaign which has drawn some criticism for suggesting women should stay at home rather than go out. It's calling for more preventable measures. Across September, October, there have been 189, 198, oh my God, confirmed reports of drink spiking and 24 reports was spiking by injection. The National Police Officer Council said the incidents took place at both licensed premises and private parties and included male and female victims. And you know what's really concerning about this? If you've ever seen people who have been pulled up on this sort of stuff, it's never the person that you expect, right? It's never the person you expect. It's never the kind of creepy looking guy that hangs around in flipping school playgrounds, right? The kind of the archetype of somebody that would do this sort of thing or the avatar or somebody that would do this sort of thing. It's never that person. It's always the most well-adjusted guy, well-adjusted girl who just is existing, paying bills, doing whatever they want to do. And they have this darkness in them that makes them want to do this sort of thing. But unfortunately as well, there is a part of me that thinks like, is this an unavoidable part of nightlife? Because it's nightlife, right? Nightlife by its very definition is in the night, in the shadows, where people generally feel like they can get away with a lot of crazy shit. I would imagine most metropolitan cities, most of the crime that involves violence, that involves sexual assault, that involves murder, that involves real terrible things right not petty crimes that like pickpocket and stuff i'd imagine most of that stuff happens at night under the cover of night because why because you can get away with it easier right put on a hoodie you know at 9 p.m 10 p.m no one bats an eyelid at you put a hoodie on at at 10 p 10 a.m in the morning going into a supermarket somewhere or whatever banaclava you might get some weird looks so obviously your chance of trying to get away with a crime increase during the night 
So it's such an unfortunate situation because, you know, ladies don't have to boycott clubs or cover their drinks with cups or bring straws themselves into nightclubs or tasers and shit, right? In order to kind of make sure they have a good night. They don't. But the reality of living in the Western society, especially with this weird thing that we have with male and female inter interactions and shit, like, this must be, again, this it is one of the maybe weird sort of... um unintended consequences of people pushing back on like pickup artists which i understand creepy don't get me wrong pick up pickup artists are creepy guys recording their interactions like trying to seduce women online isn't necessarily the greatest thing in the world even though i used to be part of that community in a small facet i used to sometimes go to some of their little seminar things i'd lead some sort of you know some kind of day game things whatever mostly under the under the guys of just kind of getting my own self-confidence up because i was terrible talking to women when i was growing up but most of it can get some of it can get really creepy as we saw with loads of accounts get taken down people's livelihoods got taken away from them rightly so right because they just don't stand for that stuff as a society but it is interesting to think that on one side people don't want men to learn tricks and techniques again tricks and techniques it makes it sound horrible but again this just is what it is techniques and whatever because the same thing with a job interview right you're trying to make somebody pick you over somebody else right so People are learning all these techniques and how to seduce somebody and how to get somebody to be romantically interested in them, sexually interested in them. They don't like that. But then on the other on the other end, there's these people who are going around spying people's drinks and injecting them so that they can do what they want with them in their own way. Right. So there's two really bad ends of the spectrum. But I feel like if we were had if we were able to have adult conversations about interactions with males and females specifically, I think we wouldn't be in such a bad position. But I think because we have such infantile discussions and because we're not mature enough, we're not adult enough to really talk about the truth of what goes on when people go out at night, the fact that some people have hooked up with kind of long term boyfriends off the back of boozy, drunken sexual escapades that they don't even remember right like and how far that can go and the idea of empowering people to go out and fuck whoever they want might be kind of kind of um contributing to this there's loads of things that are contributing to it but unfortunately because we can't have adult conversation we just have to kind of look at the crime itself right the heinous levels that people or the the evilness that must exist in some way to go in with a syringe to a nightclub it with the intention of pricking somebody so that they kind of fall under your spell and you could do what you want to them like that's just insane putting something in their drink all that is wild absolutely wild um and again i don't blame girls for for kind of you know deciding to sort of like um boycott clubs and strike and not go out anymore i don't blame you i really don't because if i was a female um and i was going out like that i necessarily i wouldn't go on my own because again that's what i found out in the, in the flipping house party which is why I think it's super important as a dude to always keep a real good close close group of friends that happen to be female that that you have platonic relationship with because it's always interesting it's always good and eye opening to find out how, what the other sex go through because again you don't live in their shoes you don't know what happens day to day but I remember that house party one of the girls saying effectively that she's never ordered um, an Uber Eats or a Deliveroo to a house by herself never. She, she doesn't even know. I mean, it's always been with friends. So she kind of like was feeling a little bit left out. Yeah, you know, I don't know. The conversation I think changed to something about Uber Eats. It's like, oh man, I wish I could order that. So it was like, oh, she'd never ordered it by herself because she's always had to wait for somebody to be with her. And again, you know, when you're, if you know anything about ordering online, you'd know that once somebody comes to your house, whatever you want to order goes out the window because you have to have this back and forth. And I was like, rah, Ted. As a girl, you can't even think of, you, there's something you have to keep in mind. Like I can't order a pizza from Domino's, a medium on my own because that guy is already going to know that I'm alone by myself. So you're going to have to order two, that you're spending more money. You know what I mean? It's just a crazy situation to be in as a female, but you know, as a woman in general going out. But again, it's just the unfortunate nature of the world, isn't it? And I think part of me thinks, hey, the world is full of sick, evil people. You should maybe kind of navigate accordingly and you shouldn't try to aim to get to a space where everybody isn't doing this because I think evilness is always going to exist. But part of me also thinks, why should you have to do that as a woman? Why should you have to go out with so many precautions? Why can't we get to a point in society where that sort of stuff isn't a worry anymore? Why? Why can't that be an option? And again, I don't know if that's possible. I don't know what things that we can do to make that um, to make that change day to day. Obviously, as as guys, you can call out your own friends. 
Um, you can maybe spot all that sort of stuff if you're out. But for the most part, from what I've seen, yes, you might hear from your friends about certain people in your friendship group. But from a guy's social group, usually, if you've got a guy that's got bad intentions, that's dark, they're usually really good at keeping it away from their friends. They're usually good at keeping it hidden. They're usually good at kind of having two different faces that, that, that they show. They're usually really good at that. They're usually ex it, it, amazingly good at manipulation, right? They're really, really good at that. So if that's the case, you're never really going to find out until it's too late, until this, this guy's mug shuts up on the news or something. You know what I mean? But yeah, what a terrible situation to be in all around. It continues here. Helen Lever Helen Leverly Laverly, yeah, Le Laver Laverly, Laverly, nineteen felt motivated to join Mia, organizing the Loughborough Girls Night In campaign after noticing how many of her peers felt unsafe on night sight in recent weeks. Loughborough Uni is again, let's just, let's talk about the universities too. These part of universities that essentially build themselves on being part of universities and get students to come in off the basis of how much of a good time they're gonna have going out also happen to be the place where all these rampant flipping cases are going down, isn't it? I can imagine the Nottingham's of this, the matches like they oh, oh. Story for another day. She says, on a night out, you could see all these girls holding their arms. She says in response to the reports about spiking with needles. In Jesus Christ. Oh, this is so horrible. In Leeds, 20 year old university students Jocelyn Story and Isabel Davis also started a girls' night out in um, girls' night in account. The movement is not centralized, but there is a WhatsApp group for members. Jocelyn and Isabel helped to create an Instagram page for City. For the city on in 18th October and already have 4,000 followers, which Jocelyn says is a testament to the boiling point that women have reached. Um, cool. Uh, for too long, spiking has been ingrained part of university and going out in culture and far too long the issues of women's safety has been a women's problem. We're trying to shift the narrative from victim blaming to perpetrator shaming. Organisers understand the criticism from some that encourage women to stay at home it feels like a contradiction but they feel the financial impact on venues is what they require sadly a lot of businesses aren't going to stay it, to take it seriously and introduce policy to change and a 20 a third year policy uh, politics student at university of bristol says that there are short and long-term aims for the group we're not here to villainize the nightlife industry if anything we want to work with them so people continue to go out yeah these girls seem like they've got level head on head level head on their shoulders the victim blaming thing i never understood Again, I, I didn't say what I said at the beginning as a victim blaming. It's just more so the nature of going out at night. It's just you're going to, if you go out at night a lot, you're probably going to see more fucked up shit. You're probably maybe going to encounter more fucked up shit. And you're probably maybe going to be at the end of more fucked up shit. It just is what it is. The only way you can avoid it is to stay in. But staying in, living like a hermit, like a DSP, isn't necessarily the best way to go about your life. You need to live, you need to interact, you need to socialize, all this sort of stuff. So I get it. But the perpetrator shaming is an interesting thing, right? Because they generally don't find the people that do this sort of stuff, right? Because the rate, the, uh, from what I remember, the cases of people getting convicted for rape is mad, mad, mad low, considering how often it essentially happens. Now, some may argue the reason why it's hap that happened because the numbers are skewed, because you'd imagine a lot of the interaction, a lot, a lot, the, you'd imagine some portion of rape cases might involve people who have known each other previously. So there, the lines are blurred, blah, 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 whatever, who knows? But it's just interesting how utterly useless police are when it comes to this sort of stuff. Like, legitimately useless. They have CCTV in clubs, um, for the most part. Police officers maybe have detailed reports of instances that have been happening in clubs. So they have evidence that they can kind of cross-reference and shit. And they still can't find people. They can't find them. They can't network out who did it, why they did it, where they might be, their profile, nothing. It, all it takes is somebody... It actually takes the perpetrator making a cat you know a catastrophic mistake right um, leaving a fingerprint doing something crazy dna whatever then they find them but in terms of investigating it through witness reports and whatnot they don't nothing happens so it doesn't surprise me that it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of these cases go unreported just because girls have heard different stories from their other friends who have gone through gone through all the investigation had all the flipping swabs taken had been de dehumanized and felt you know, um, felt violated and even the investigation to the point where they're like, you know what, I'm not, I, I would rather do what like most people do in the world, just bury their head in the sand, bury that emotion, put it in a box deep, deep, deep into your subconscious and hope it kind of goes away. 
which is terrible. You know what I mean? Which is utterly, utterly terrible. But again, big up these girls for doing something, trying to make some sort of change. Hopefully it does help going forward. Again, as guys, all we can do is call out our friends when we do this, see that sort of action and not excuse it. I know there are some sicko guys that exist out there that are like, oh no, it's their fault. Look what she's wearing. It's like, no, 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 no. We can't have that. Women form the bedrock of nightlife for the most part. Um, especially if you're a straight dude, you know for the most part you don't necessarily go out to go and impress other guys, you go out to impress girls. So if that's the case, you want them to feel safe, you want them to feel welcomed, um, and you just want them to have a good time. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't necessarily agree with the notion or the idea that every time you go out, you should try and hook up with somebody. I think that's a bizarre way to look at nights out. It's essentially like you're going out on a hunt or something. It's flipping odd. In the times that I've gone out and been successful hooking up, for the most part, I've been times where I've gone out with no intention whatsoever. It's just, that's always the case. Same with job interviews. I keep into job interviews. It's the same thing. The moment you're too desperate for one and you seem to, to you, you seem like a gagging for it is the moment you always get rejected. The moment you're loose and you're at ease is the moment something might happen something might occur and usually that's usually and that and to me that's usually the case and if you're a guy that has to resort to spiking people's drinks in order to kind of get somebody to sleep with you you're a piece of shit that's it you're a piece of shit you're a piece of shit you deserve to get buried under the jail the kids deserve to be thrown into the middle of the ocean and your family deserve to have no closure as to what attack happened to you that's exactly what you deserve all the time for sure but again it's good they're making some sort of change it's good that they're trying to um change the conversation around this and hopefully the change that they're talking about is going to make some sort of difference going forward one can only hope in it one can only hope okay let's move on from that oh my throat this ginger is fucking good okay let's talk about this tragic story because you know it's in the news all day and there's a couple of updates happening here so this is courtesy of the Los Angeles Times. Happened the other day. Um, tragic, tragic, tragic story, especially for people who just work jobs in these sort of entertainment y, creative, fashion y environments, right? Where you're not necessarily the talent, you're not necessarily the star. You're just part of the sort of support structure that helps to keep this industry kind of moving, right? And for the most part, you're doing that job because you love it. You're doing that job because it's a vocation. You're also doing that job because you love the industry or whatever it may be. And it's kind of a job for life, right? You get yourself in these sort of places. From, again, from the little time that I spent being an extra on film sets and whatnot, I know that most of the hair and makeup people are lovely people. Most of the people that do all the assisting and camera sort of stuff are lovely people. You get friendly with them, you're, you're set for life, right? And usually they go a long way in terms of influences sometimes who people get jobs and their reputations and what stories get leaked to the press. Like mad different things, but they, they are the bedrock of that industry. And usually if you do a good job, and you just, you know, for the most part, if you're on time, you're pleasant to work with, you you essentially got yourself a job for life. So when you hear these sort of stories, it kind of touches you more because you know of people in your life who have done those kind of jobs. You can identify, you can identify that person as well because you've kind of worked in that position. And it's also just such a terrible, terrible accident, a terrible mistake that's led to such a tragedy that you just can't even wrap your head around it. Do you know what I mean? It's just one of those weird things that happens. You're like, God damn it. So it's actually Los Angeles Times. It says a search warrant reveals grim details of rush shooting and inhaler Hutchins final minutes, right? And it says here, actor Alec Baldwin was practicing removing a revolver from his holster and aiming towards the camera during a rehearsal for the movie Rust. When director Joel Swerza heard what sounded like a whip and then a loud pop. According to a search warrant that provided grim new details about the final minutes of cinematographer Hyla Hutchins' life. In a newly released document obtained by Los Angeles Times on Sunday night, Swerza said that the weapon had been described to him as a cold gun meaning it did not have any live rounds. But the gun discharged, striking Hutchins in the chest and Swaza in the right shoulder, according to Santa Fe County NM Sheriff Detective Affidavit, um, uh, Detective Affidavit used to obtain a search warrant. Hutchins was pronounced dead at the Albuquerque Hospital. So it struck her in the chest, maybe went straight through her heart, maybe her lungs or whatever. It went. It, she, she basically got hit in the one place in the body that could result in you dying straight away from a single bullet wound. Because, you know, that's usually the place people tell you to aim if you want to, you know, um, if you want to stop somebody, right? Um, center of mass. And that's where she got hit. She got hit in the shoulder, like the director, on the leg, maybe that missing artery, something. She would have probably been alive to this day. So that's the tragic part of it, right? It's such a tragedy. Um, Suaza's statement to a detective offered a new window into the onset 
sorry, shooting on Thursday that left Hollywood reeling and calling for safe working conditions on the set. The shooting took place after six members of the film crew walked off the set after the complaining of the production company about the payment and housing. Camera operator Reed Russell told Detective um, Joe Cano, Carol, sorry, Russell's and Swaz's statements to the detective offered the most detailed chronology yet of how the tragedy unfolded. So obviously, there's stuff happening before in the day. The day started late because the production had hired a replacement camera crew and the were and was working with only one camera, Swaz so as a detective. Um, aside from the Baldwin, um uh, Swaza said that two people were handling the gun from the scene, Armour, Hannah, Gertz and Reed, and then the assistant director David Halls who handed the gun to Baldwin. Because of the COVID nineteen protocols, um uh Gutierrez Reed set up three pop guns on a car outside Bonanza Creek Ranch Church set. The focus of the search warrant. Halls did not know Live rounds were in the gun that was handed to Baldwin and Halls yelled cold gun according to affidavit, which again shows a complete incompetence when it comes to the people that were dealing with making sure those guns weren't live. I could understand why somebody doesn't do a last minute check before they hand it to the person um, on the set just to make sure, similar to what they do, you know, when they take, when kind of space shuttles are going off, like they just go through stuff last minute just to make sure. I know we'll go through the protocols beforehand, but let me just make one last check just in case, because you never know, because again, you know, we've had flipping space shuttle tra tragedies where one little ring went off on a bolt and it essentially led, led to the whole spaceship kind of blowing up. So if that's the case, doing one last check before something's handed to the star of the show before he kind of points and maybe pulls the trigger might be a good option to go about things. But again, we move. Swaza told detectives that the cast and the crew had been preparing a scene before lunch, then took a meal break away from the rehearsal area around 12.30pm. When they returned, Swaza said he wasn't sure whether the gunner was checked again, which it wasn't. He also addressed the possibility of a cast and crew members bringing onto the set live ammunition and live rounds, which can include potentially dangerous blanks. God almighty. Joe said as far as he was knows, no one gets checked for live ammunition on their person or prior after the scenes are being filmed. They only start the only thing checked on the firearms is to avoid live ammunition being in them. Joe stated that there should never be live rounds whatsoever near or around the scene. When they came back from lunch, creeping sh a creeping shadow prompted a camera to be point moved to a different angle, Russell told the detective. As Alec Baldwin was explaining how he was going to draw the gun, where his arm would be positioned, it discharged, Russell said. So again, another unlucky... Again, sometimes in life you wonder if this is our like, if this is like just part of your fate. This is such an unlucky set of circumstances that he just he doesn't even bear f fucking thinking of. The people that usually check the guns 27 or you know 27 times before they hand it over to the to the star of the show didn't check it. They go for lunch, they come back, suddenly the sun is starting to set, different shadows are kind of protruding in the set film set. So they move the camera of the angle or the, 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 the camera angle, which might have put the woman directly in line of sight with Alec Baldwin's gun. He then is practicing how to discharge it or unmount it from his gun holster and suddenly hits on the chest. The one place that you don't want to hit if you don't want to be hit by one bullet. It's just like, God, man. God, oh God. Swaza said that he was looking over Hutchins' shoulder when the gun discharged. Hutchin grabbed um, her midsection, stumbled backwards and was assisted ground, uh, Swaza said the detective. Russell recalled hearing a loud bang, seeing, seeing Swaza's bloody and hearing Hutchins say she couldn't feel her legs. Jesus Christ. Um, crew members called uh, in 911 asking for help. Script supervisor Mammy Mitchell expressed frustration that an assistant director yelled at her at lunch and asked about revisions according to an audio from a 9-11 obtained in Times. He's supposed to check the guns, Mitchell said on 9-11 call. He's responsible for what happens on the set. Mitchell told the 9-11 operator that she could not say whether the gun was loaded on the real bullet. Hall's the first assistant did not comment at the time's request. Again, that lady's been, oof. Hordes has come under um, under scrutiny before. In 2019, he was um, fired from a film set of Freedom Pass after the crew member had a minor and temporary injury with a prop gun. Um, according to the producer, the film who, from the film, who declined to comment or named because he was not authorised to comment. Because they signed NDAs, I'm assuming, right? That same year, Halls was brought in to replace first assistant director Courtney Hope F F um, Ferrand on the film The Pale Door after he was let go. After she was let go from the job, Fiona said the Oklahoma production had made many safety issues, and she pushed back on such as a non-safety plan for the tornado in the tornado zone. That's when they brought in Dave because he had a reputation for being lax on safety. Apparently, when the first AD walks off the project, Dave is known to be the guy you call. <sighs> 
God damn it, man. The Hollywood entertainment industry just like proving once again what pieces of shit they are, innit? Diversity, inclusion, representing marginalized voices, all this nonsense they spout. But God almighty, people are terrible, innit? They are terrible people. Aaron K. Kutz. Kuntz, um, whose Paper Street Pictures was a production company on the Pale Door, refuted the fear and order, was fired because she was overzealous about safety and said Halls did not replace her because of the supposed relaxed attitude towards the safety. But Kuntz did acknowledge that the movie unit production uh, manager received safety complaints about Halls during production relating to weather hazards. So he disputes what she said, but doesn't offer a counter, counter narrative. That's usually when you know someone's lying. Dave was frustrated at the amount of time it was taken in between lightning lightning delays, said Coots, who also directed the film. I do remember him growing frustrated. Hey, the lighting is far away. We're good, uh, we're good guys. Can we go? We're good guys. Can we go? We need to go. I don't think uh, much of it at the time. Just say Dave's a fiery guy. On the action thriller One Way shot in Georgia in February, a camera assistant said Halls did not hold a safety meeting before shooting a dangerous scene involving a Russian arm, a crane-like piece of equipment that is attached to a high-speed machine during filming. They reported and reported her concerns to two producers and a local union representation. Those individuals did not comment for a response. Of course. The quote says he has this misdemeanor that is almost like he doesn't take anything seriously. Um, it got so bad that I had a meeting with the production team to tell them he didn't care about our safety and it wasn't right. Long was surprised when filming began that the highway um, that had been cleared of the outside traffic, especially because it was uh, raining that day. Meanwhile, she said the walkie talkies were filled with so much chatter that instructions were muddled and that two vehicles being used by the production nearly collided. <laughs> Man, these people are so shit at their job. It's not even fun. Honestly, it's not funny, but it is how terrible these guys are. People at their job. That's when we finally stopped everything. I said, y'all can't, y'all can't talk on the radios anymore. We'll direct this. Usually with this very expensive piece of equipment, we'll come in the day before and talk about what we're looking for. There's rehearsals with a stunt team, extensive safety meetings. We had none of that. Santa Fe County authorities are still trying to determine what kind of um, projectile killed Hutchins. Santa Fe County Chief Officer or Spokesperson Joanne Reese said on Monday, hopefully ballistics and the forensics involved in the ballistics will help to determine that. So they're saying something may have got lodged in the gun holster in the kind of chamber where the bullets go which might explain why it kind of hit the woman and again she died with that um people are explaining that maybe shrapnel something happened in there but again that could have been easily avoided if somebody checked the gun but again you know um the department of investigation will not be limited to the fatality of the limits um the events of the immediately preceding the area so the continuity the sheriff's office is looking at this case in much more greater scope as opposed to the shooting that occurred on set and the life and the loss of life the investigators along with the sheriff's office are looking at everything that should have been followed from safety standards on on down the search warrant allowed for seizure of all firearms fire components used for the unused ammunition the sheriff's office said that it had taken blood saliva and skin and hair samples but did not disclose whose samples it was testing a search warrant return shows the detectives recovered nine spent casings three blank revolvers and a fanny pack of ammunition and loose ammo in the tray they also took clothing of those present and blood swords and photos district attorney da, da, da. we are assisting santa fe um Russ movie production said the statement that the safety of his crew is his top priority and it was not aware of any petition on sunday the company said it would shut down the film production during the investigation did not rule out restarting of course they're gonna restart <laughs> i just death follows the other incidents da, 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 da. so yeah tragic situation um so far there's been a narrative online of people saying that you know alec baldwin should be charged with murder which is insane he should be charged with something some sort of involuntary manslaughter um i think somebody has to pay for this whoever it is someone has to pay um i think the fact that he can just walk away from this after essentially you know causing the death of somebody or leading to somebody's loss of life is insane um but i also think it's just a tragic mistake for him involved being an actor like you're not the person it's sort of similar to being a dj kind of and sometimes you get asked to promote nights or something and you you know if you want to do it as a favor you do it but it's, it shouldn't be a prerequisite of you getting booked to play somewhere. Obviously, there's some raves or events that happen that you have to kind of do that sort of thing as part of the deal. But I would imagine as being an actor, you you shouldn't be involved in the safety procedures of the staff and the set 
because you have enough team to worry about in terms of your own performance and remembering your lines. You should be focused on that. Everyone's got their role, they do their job. So you're hoping that people on the outside are doing that whilst you're in your trade and reversing your lines or you know doing lines off the flipping table. You hope that's what's happening. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but you hope that's what is, that is actually happening. And then when it comes to you filming, you're ready to go and all, all things have been done, isn't it? all the I's have been dotted, all T's have been crossed. In this case, that didn't happen. So everyone who's involved has to pay in some regards. Will they pay? Probably not. We know how these things go, um, unfortunately. Um, but it is such an unfortunate event. Again, thoughts and feelings go out to Hale, um, Hale, Hale, is it her name? Highland Hutchins or Miss Hutchins, regardless. Um, thoughts and feelings go out to her and her family and friends. Um, she's a mum, a wife, a sister, right? A niece. Like, it's just, yeah, it's just tragic, man. An auntie, it's just tragic. Tragic all around. Can't imagine what that must feel like as a family, knowing again, there's Instagram pictures of people uploading of her saying how happy she was to be on set, riding horses and shit, and just living life in it of a production assistant or whatever, or, or whatever role that she was doing in film, right? It's just a tragic situation all around, man. Really, really tragic. But hearts and feelings go out to everybody associated with her and her family. What else do we have to talk about here? Well, how much time have I used so far? I don't want to keep you guys forever and ever and ever. One fourteen. You know what? It's one fourteen. Maybe I'll end it there actually at one fourteen. Yeah. M maybe maybe I'll pause there at one fourteen. Thanks again for tuning in at one fourteen. I think I'll leave it there for now. Bit of a somber place to end it. But I'm hoping you're okay with that. I'm hoping. Fingers crossed. And I'll see you guys again again recently or soon. Actually, I'll film another one later on today. But until then, guys, take care. Be safe. Peace.